Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with my friend JJ Blair. How are you? Hi. How are you? We've been threatening to do this for, yes. I don't know, two AESs, three NAMs, and a, yes. and a, and a partridge and in a pear tree. tree. Yes. Yeah. So here we are. We're finally going to do a studio tour. Yes. I'm, I've been looking forward to it for three AES, AESs and two NAMs. I tease him all the time. Hmm. I mean, we're, we were in the car a few months ago, and he plays in the punk rock band. And a new Iggy song comes on the radio, and you can tell us it. You know, I'm like, oh, is this? This must. I haven't heard this. It must be the new album. And and he's like, maybe. I'm like, wait there. You do know who this is? He's like, no. I'm like, how can you be into <laughs> punk rock and not know who Iggy Pop is? It's pretty well, much like, when, how can you be into music and not know who Iggy Pop is? When I was looking for a new intern slash to become assistant, uh, Ryan Hewitt put up a thing saying like, you know, so of course I start getting flooded, mm -hmm. and, and I meet with everybody, and one guy. And I ask everyone the same thing, like, do you play anything? Okay, who are your influences? And my uh, current assistant, Gabe, I go, I go, you know, what do you, you know, do you play guitar? Who are your influences? Jesse Ed Davis, you're hired. It's like, like, oh, sure. you're, you're certified at Pro Tools. You even know who Jesse Ed Davis is. You're hired. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. CJ Vanston was uh, saying exactly the same thing. It's like um, he was working with an artist and, and, He's like, oh, I can get Scum Baxter to come down and play this. I think it'd be great. And the artist's just like, who's that? And he's like, Doobie Brothers? I'm like, nope. Steely Dan? Nope. I'm like, Are you in the right business? <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah. I don't know. What, the thing is, I don't know what it's like to be that young. So uh, now. So I yeah. don't know how for us, you know, I used to go. But to it's, e it's even easier to find stuff now. I mean, the the... You know, I would hear a track on the radio back then, and mm -hmm. and and the lengths I would have to go to find something. You know, you were lucky if the record store had it, or if it was even in print somewhere. Sure. And I remember the the guy who has the records who would be out in front of uh, 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 Roscoe's. I go, you know, I I go like, find me every Curtis Mayfield record you can, because you know, like seventy percent of them were out of print. Or you can, or had never been transferred to CD, so you sure. would, you know, things like that. It would be, and now you can just find anything on Spotify or YouTube, or so they have no excuse, really, do they? I agree, but I also wonder, um, like anything, if it's difficult to do something, the pushing against it is what creates that love. Yeah, it's. I agree, I agree, and I, and plus, then it's your little secret too. Absolutely. I misquote this, um, but there's the Segovia quote about uh, all of his best students gave up. And, you know, you can take it two ways. Like, wow, you mean John Williams wasn't that great? No, of course he was amazing. But I, I think the, the point is, is when things come too easy, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, I played guitar for a bit. Right. I mean, I remember there's a couple of kids in my school that would like make me look stupid. They were so good. But it came too easily. And... Now they're I don't know, probably making more money as accountants, but, but anyway. <laughs> and on top of it, I like hearing the struggle when it comes to an instrument. Mm -hmm. I like hearing the struggle. Oh yeah. I don't I don't want to hear someone where it's just every note just sounds so easy. I want to hear this. You know, my favorite guitar players or whatever. It's not you know, sure. even like he'd listen to Coltrane and there was still he was kind of trying to reach beyond, you know, as much of a virtuoso as he was. He was always trying to reach beyond. Mm -hmm what even the instrument was capable of. So sure. there was some struggle in there. And when I hear someone who can just blow arpeggios mindlessly and in, in absolute perfection, I, it, it's like, I miss, I miss hearing like. Absolutely. So, I, th I just think in all areas of humanity, that's yeah. true. I always use the analogy of Pete Sampras. Pete Sampras came along after the golden era of the Bjorgs and the, and the, and the Connors and, and, and the McEnroes. Yeah. And came along and was just probably the most perfect tennis player ever. Serve volley, serve volley, serve volley. And ten tennis viewing went. Pfft. Yeah. Well, but that's because his serves were so big. I, I really got turned off at tennis by the time. It was more interesting to watch women's tennis because mm -hmm. it was just serve done. You know, yeah. you could, like, how can you, yep. how can you, you know, defend against a 120 mile an hour serve? Yep. It's just. I think we, we admire perfection, but we get bored of it really quickly. Yeah. But and but you know it. But it's that it's that difficulty. It's like for me, you know, my when I'm producing, it's always about the song first. Every sure. you know everything, 
before we even go in the studio, can a song pass the campfire test? And, 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 and what I love, and, and it comes to a solo or a song, there's that moment of tension and then like release, you know? Sure. And, and, uh, and like a good chorus is set up sometimes by a pre-chorus where there's like the tension and mm -hmm. whatever. And so it's, it's that moment of difficulty and then like, oh, he pulled it off. Right, I always absolutely. like that. So, you know, whether it's, whether it's uh, tennis or playing guitar or saxophone, whatever, those are always the moments where it's like, you're like, oh, is he painted? In oh, no, he, he, he's, you know, he sticks to the landing. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of your stuff is like super organic. You were just telling me, actually, you're inadvertently mixing some EDM. Oh, yeah. It must be kind of fun. What do you think you bring to that? I mean, everything for me is about a sense of musicality. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an an instance, uh, I was mixing something for somebody else and we came up to this bridge of this song and I could feel like, hey, all of a sudden this song feels hollow right mm -hmm. here. There's something missing in the mid-range. There's some information, the energy just kind of sucked out right here. And I just went, I dialed up a keyboard sound and I just played footballs through that section mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it felt complete. And all it needed was just like a sonic space. You know, same thing with the record I'm doing right now. We, we were tracking in Nashville and I'd listen to the roughs and go, you know, there's there's some energy missing in this song in this area. We need to put some Wurlitzer in here. And everyone was like, you're right, you know, and it filled it in. And then, and, and, and so I think regardless of the type of music, it's just a perspective and, and I guess, you know, an aesthetic. I think I have a, and it's not so much that I've learned in some respects, I've learned better technique over the years when I listen to recordings I've made 23 years ago or however long ago. But also I have a better understanding of like, oh, how things fit together mm -hmm. and, and you know, what brings out certain things, what steps on certain things, what complements things, what kind of glues everything together. So regardless of the type of music, whether I'm doing jazz, traditional jazz or EDM, I can feel like, hey this works or this doesn't work and right. and 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 that's i think the most important thing that you know and 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 there are some people who who have incredible technical knowledge about recording who just have a terrible aesthetic mm -hmm. that's the one thing that maybe i'll toot my horn on is like yeah or, or why people will go to me because they enjoy my aesthetic and some people don't you know i always say that once you hit a certain uh, level of competency, mm -hmm. and this goes as an instrument or as a producer or as an engineer, you hit a certain level of competency and then it becomes about opinion. Sure. This is my opinion of how music should sound. This is my opinion of what a snare sounds like. This is my opinion of you know, what's a good song. Um, and either you agree with it or you don't. And then hopefully most people agree with my opinion. <laughs> right, absolutely. I, do you feel, I feel my personal journey was one of not being technically competent, so I didn't get in the way of the musician at mm -hmm. first. Then the middle of my career was getting good at my craft and getting in the way of the musician. And now, hopefully, God willing, now I'm in a place where I can choose when to exert some technique and when just to get out of the way and let them perform. Well, this is, and I tell this story a lot, but I think it's really important. I, I have what I call the Al Green rule. Mm. Listen to Al Green records. The fidelity is horrible. Like sure. the, the machine is terribly aligned. It's just like, but no one's ever, nobody outside of anyone who knows how to record has ever noticed or ever cared because the songs are great. Sure. The performances are great. And in the end, it sounds musical. Mm -hmm. You know, I listen to Jagged Little Pill and it sounds like Blackface ADATS. Sure. 24 million people didn't care mm -hmm. because the songs were great, you know, and, and, and were meaningful to them. Uh, and so that's the important thing. In the 90s, there was an engineer who, you know, everyone who was doing this and it became his shtick and became famous for it. So everyone thought, this is how you engineer. You have to go through every single piece of gear and see mm -hmm. what's the closest thing. I have a friend who says, you know, what's proximity effect? It's like, what's the closest mic to what I'm doing? That's what sure. proximity effect is. And that's really more important to me is, uh, I, you know, this, this said nameless engineer, I had a friend who made a record with him. They spent two hours trying different mic pre's for a tambourine track, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous. I want to get, you know, I cut my teeth doing a lot of uh, commercial uh, dates, you know, so you have union guys coming in, you have people from the ad agency coming in, you have set amount of time, you have 10 minutes to get your drum sound and it has to be usable because we can't have the union guys going to overtime or what, 
you know, and whatnot. Uh, and the record I was just doing, I have a room full of musicians and, and, you know, we're doing everything in two, three takes and I don't want to be the weak link. I want to get something that's good. I want to get something that's good and not get in their way, you know, because ultimately what they're playing is more important than what I'm doing to make it sound. And my favorite story to tell on this was, uh, when I did June Carter Cash's record, uh, she's going to do her duet with Johnny who had been in a coma for two weeks and he has pneumonia and he's really weak. Right. And then we're going to do this big emotional thing. And, you know, and he comes over into the, into the cabin to record and he's been gathering up his strength all week and, and there's no patch bay and there's my favorite black faced ADATs. And I'm, uh, and I'm, you know, behind there with the XLRs trying to find like the empty track. And he's like, you know, whenever you're ready, I'm ready to go. We got to go now, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, and, and I don't get to go like, well, let me see. Do you sound better on the 47 <laughs> or on the, it, it's just, I got to go like, this is my instinct, you know, know your, know your gear. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, and, and if sometimes your guess is wrong and what's the quickest thing that you can do to make it work, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and as a result, it's not my best sounding recording, but what I got was my favorite recording because it's my most emotional recording. Like there wasn't a dry eye in the room after the take mm -hmm. and, and people who know them and know the story hear that song and they cry. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's, you know, so that's ultimately what I'm trying to serve more than like, well, is the, is the mic pre overmodulating? Is this the, you know, is this really the right compressor for someone with that type of voice? So that's what I have to remind myself sometimes is like to make my process be as unobtrusive with whatever is going on with the creativity. Because uh, I can get caught up in my whole OCD-ness about like, oh, well, it's kind of like he really maybe sound better on the 49 than the 47. So give me like five minutes to change it and let mm -hmm. the tube warm up. And you know, no one has time for that shit. We want to, you know, they want to make music and, and, and I don't want to step on their toes. And that's kind of the philosophy that I've, and, and I'm, and people who work from work with me know that like the speed at which I work is part of my deal. And I, I like to be reliable in that context. And I think that's a, you know, a good thing for people to learn is like, be quick because ultimately it's not about us. It's about the guy on that side of the glass. Mm -hmm. So if that answers your question in some long-winded fashion. No, I love it. <laughs> I, I feel like when we hear or read those kind of stories about, oh yeah, he just used a, and it's always an inexpensive piece of equipment, we get tend to get carried away with what the equipment was when the message is just the performance was all that mattered. You know, like we all know that the Beatles use, what, D19s and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that, Jeff Emmerich said that they were moving fast and it was just always plugged in. Yeah. You, you know, and yes, there's obviously certain mics that have certain characteristics, which are wonderful in certain instruments, but that D19 I heard just we got kind of moved. Like, yeah. I want to do this. And they just and they just happen to be a, a really nice sounding, very musical mic, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you can use in a bunch of situations. And you're like, yeah, this doesn't suck. Let's go with it. Yep. Because the performance was key. But that's usually someone asked, like, why did you use that mic? Well, it was the one available and it was the closest one that was plugged in. Yeah. That wasn't on something else. And I thought, like, yeah, this will work. And the artist has this idea, wants to do this overdub, catch it. Like you said, hasn't got 20 minutes for you to figure out what could be the other one. Right. He's wandered off to get a cup of coffee and you're repatching something. Yeah. Yeah. And the moment's gone. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's what our, our job more is about capturing moments than it is capturing sonic perfection right you know we're trying to record a moment in time and uh if if that moment in time is gone then it's gone yeah the last time i was in here we realized was a long time ago yes you were blonde i was blonde yeah <laughs> that's a long time ago that studio was full of roger manning's keyboards yes that was during uh we were doing the tv eyes record that's right and, so uh, that that will tell us what year it was. Jesus, I don't remember. I, you know, I I only remember who I was dating at the time, and I'm not going <laughs> to say it out loud because it's embarrassing. But um, it was a different part of my life. But uh, yeah, that was fun. Boy, that was you know because I love. I didn't know Brian Reitzel 
and to before that, but I've been friends with Jason Faulkner for a long time mm -hmm. um, because I was an early uh, patron of the Grays because mm -hmm. John Bryan was living on my couch and they were looking for a record deal. I'm like, hey, I own a rehearsal studio. You guys have carte blanche until you get a deal. I love you guys. I love your band, you, you know, and um, and uh, and Roger is man, talk about a guy that you want to make a record with where it's just nonstop hilarity. And he always shows up with some really messed up video like you got to see this. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and and of course, three really incredible musicians who I got to. I got to learn a lot. I love I love when you're working with guys who, especially you know Roger, because I own a lot of synths, and you're seeing people do stuff that like, oh that's oh that's how they did that, you know, and uh, it was very educational to work with those guys and, and and see some of the, you know, old school synth techniques that I was not hip to, mm -hmm. but it was, and a lot of laughs. Fantastic. Yeah, I remember I remember that record. Yeah, it was a great record. And yeah, and Justin Stanley wound up, and I, ran, I just ran into Justin. Justin Stanley wound up mixing it. Which is crazy, because his name came up last night in a, in a, at a dinner. Well, it's funny, because Justin, the first major label record I ever did was uh, a woman named Kathleen Wilhoyt, who's a fantastic singer-songwriter. And Justin's wife, Nika Costa, was, it was before she was Nika Costa, you know, mm -hmm. you know and she was a backup singer. For Morty. For yeah, but and bit on and, and on Kathleen's record. Mm -hmm. And and Justin would call me up and, and he'd be like, Hey, I'm I'm building the studio, you know, and he's and I love that. Like he's calling me, asking me, like, hey, what's your opinion on this stuff? And then, you know, talk to him, what are you doing? Oh, I'm engineering Eric Clapton's new record, you know. Yeah. I'm like, awesome, I love that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's a crazy business. So uh I'd love to know a little bit more about your studio, because I remember the first time I came over here all those years ago, I just was like at that point, I don't think for a, I don't think I'd seen this much equipment outside of like East West. <laughs> well, Although now you probably have more than East I, West. I, I, yeah. No, well, East West has more. I, I I like my mic locker a little better, but they than East West, but they do yeah. have some good stuff. Um, well, originally I was in '94. The real estate market was embarrassingly dirt cheap, and I was able to. I, I just happened to be fortunate to buy this house for what was such an embarrassingly small number. I don't want to tell people because they'll hate me, but it was one of the smarter things I'd ever done in my life. And it had this little in-law apartment mm. and I wanted to do something where I could build a studio. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you're gonna build a home studio. Here's the guy, Brett Teeny. he designed Bob Clear Mountain's place. And he, I think he also wound up doing Paisley Park and, and um, but, and I was like, yeah, let's start right from the beginning, which was a, a real benefit to start off with proper acoustics so you don't wind up doing something and then spending the next year trying to fix it. It was just right from the get-go, and we were the second studio in town to have, have balanced power, so we had no noise issues. Um, and uh, and at the time, you know, because I owned co-rehearsal at the time, and, and I thought that would be a great feeder for this place, and I was very new to engineering, but I had a wonderful uh, mentor, Alan Hirschberg, and the idea was kind of like, he'd be the house engineer and I'd learn from him, and that's basically what happened. Because uh, I was having no luck before I came up, I wind up with co-rehearsal because I couldn't get a job in a regular recording studio, even as a runner or, you know, a toilet assistant, toilet assistant or anything. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, I was trying to get sideways into the recording business, and this is the way it worked out. Um, but yeah, so you know, you start out with a couple racks of things, and every time you do a record, you get some money, and you go like, God, I wish I'd had one of these on that record. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, okay, well, let's buy that. Or Especially in those days, because we were renting stuff, and you realized yeah. after six weeks, you could have bought it. Yeah, and then, you know, it's <laughs> like, oh, here's a U47 for $5,000, oh. you know, and that's the type of thing. Or <laughs> here's a BA6A for $1,500, you right. know, and, and that type, you know, it's like I have, I now have only, only, you know, 14 channels of AM16, but I originally bought, you know, in the early 90s, I bought 16 channels of AM16s from somebody for $500 for the, you know, like that's, and now they're, you know, you're, you get like the channels for a thousand bucks each type. Yeah. And, 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 and 
that I remember Hunter uh, buying must be late nineties, ten seventy threes at three hundred and fifty bucks or something. Oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, I in ninety four I paid like two grand each for my ten seventy threes in in ninety four, and that was and I wish I'd bought more at that price, right. honestly. Right. But uh, but that is how so many engineers have accumulated their stuff. They get. Sure. You're you're making a record. Something pops up. Somebody's selling something, and you you happen to you know you just got paid, and the money's burned a hole in your pocket, and it's a good deal, and and uh, you buy something, and 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 you're like, God, it would have been so helpful on this record if I just had this. Mm -hmm. And and me particularly, it was microphones. I always felt like I was short on microphones, and as we got into you know, and then I I became a microphone fetishist and then you know in, in some circles some considered a vintage microphone expert you know but that's my thing it's like i you know somebody we take a look at your mic locker we, we we certainly could actually somebody called the other day somebody called me the joe bonamassa of microphones oh, okay. that was, that uh, those of you that understand joe bonamassa's guitar collection will know what that means yeah i've seen and, i've not personally seen and, it, and i'm not quite amazing. to joe's level with microphones as he has with guitars, sure. and, and it's and it's stupid. He has 958 to 1960 sunbursts alone, and a couple of flying Vs, and uh, and 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 he has a real problem. I'm I keep joking with him that I'm saving him a room at Betty Ford, but <laughs> um, but it's the same type of thing. You know, some of it is fetishism, but on the other hand, for me. Mics are the most. I, I view mics as the most important part of the recording chain, and they and and the right mic makes my job a million times easier. You know, mic selection, just everything else I do, it just makes everything a lot easier to make it sound better. I did two panels at um, to Nam, and <clears throat> my first panel had Anna Myerson on, and we were talking about you know the changeover from analog to digital. He's completely mixes in the box now. It doesn't go out analog sounding or on a console at all. And he goes, the only things he cares about are microphones and speakers. So now he's buying microphones and speakers. He said everything else can live digital as far as he's concerned, but those are the two things for him. Well, and particularly because Alan does so much orchestral stuff, mm -hmm. You don't want a colored pre on orchestral. You want, you know, you want the plainest, most boring, quietest pre, but you want like the, you certainly want the right microphone, you know. Uh, and I, you know, I think if you're making records and doing rock and bands and stuff like that, you're a little pickier about like, yeah, I want this pre and this EQ, but definitely for, you know, and Alan's really, really good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and. Um, I was a little intimidated because it was like there was like three or four rock guys. It was me and Dave Way and and Gavin Lewis and and, and Ruben and, and I was like, that's, you know, we can talk about accidentally clipping and distorting and like ah whatever, you know, it compressed too hard. And there's a guy that's like everything's pristine. Yeah. I mean, his stuff is is uh, yeah very hi-fi. Yeah, strings are fun. I don't know that I would want it to be the only thing that I do, but it's fun when you get to do it, especially because you feel like, oh, I'm a real engineer now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, because, you know, you really have to, you know, you have so many microphones going and phase is so important mm. and and uh, you're really trying to capture like this whole thing. And those are the times like you really feel like a real engineer when you're doing, you know, an orchestral date or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of fun. Horns as well. That yeah. Did we do horns here? We did on, on the multi record. We, we did with the guy who um, I don't remember his name. The 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 arranger was the guy who did all the early Van Morrison records. That's right. Yeah. And and I guess he was yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And he came in and he admonished me for over compressing the uh, horn section, which was you know yeah. because you're young, you're like it's compression, it's fucking awesome. Let's let's, let's do more of it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's I thought it sounded great. I thought the horns were amazing. And he, he, yeah, I, I, I listen. You know, I listened to him. I, I was a little like, oh, whatever, dude. I'll back off the compressor. Yeah, but. I mean, you we took you go back to the Al Green stuff uh, for those those people that have had the opportunity to look at some of the some of the multi tracks that are, may or may not be available online. I mean, that stuff was not only compressed hit too hard on the mic pre, it hit the tape probably like this. Yeah. And so it's just like blobs of yeah. audio. And that was an inherent part of the sound. Love it or hate it. Definitely yeah. doesn't have all the subtleties, but it had power. 
Yeah. And, uh, and like I said before, earlier, it's, sometimes it's about it's the energy, it's mm -hmm. the context. You know, the, the most, when people are new to recording and they start picking my brain, I go like I said, it's, it's more about perception. You know, I'm like, everyone says like, oh, I want to get this John Bonham kick sound and they're trying to get all this low end. Go listen to a Led Zeppelin record and tell me how much bottom end is in that. Mm -hmm. There's like none, mm -hmm. but there's this per perception of bottom end. I said, you know, perception is more important than actually putting in certain things. It's the relationship of different instruments to stuff and, and, and how you perceive the way something sounds than the reality of <clears throat> what frequencies you're getting. You know, and 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 that's and the fact that that Al Green stuff, it sounds terrible, but it sounds like a horn section, you know, yeah. and it and it does this to the music when when you when it when it pops into the track, you're like, oh, or yeah, from a fidelity yeah, exactly. aspect, it's it's awful, but from a musicality aspect, and that's really again the difference between orchestral and rock or whatever pop music where we're trying to. We're after something different. We're after like musicality and not a, a, I, a perfect document. Absolutely. I always use raw power as my, the first time I ever heard raw power. You put on the headphones, Search and Destroy comes in and it's like, da -na -na -na, and then this guitar solo comes in like this much louder than everything else and everything just folds into the mix. But it's like, wow, this is exciting. Right. And then you hear the remix and you're like, what, what happened to that awesome? What happened to that awesome wrongness? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and, uh, I'm friends with uh, Joey Santiago from the Pixies, and he was saying to me, it's like sometimes they, they, they'll they spend hours in the studio looking for the right mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was that Paul McCartney quote where they would do a take that would just feel so good and it would always have at least one mistake in there. They go, that's the one to use. Right. I like that. Yeah. Should we look at some mics? Yeah, we'll look at some mics. Tell us about this beautiful All microphone. Right. So we're in the vocal booth, and this is the one that just kind of lives in here because it gets used more than every other mic. It's one of the best examples of a Telefunken Elam 251 um, that I've heard, and frequently a lot of people will send me their mic to evaluate against it. And uh, it's, you know, these mics, 99% of the time, it's about the capsule. The capsules all sort of vary. Um, you know, the, there's, there's what a CK-12 sounds like, but then they all kind of have a tolerance, and this is the one that is just, for me, been the most special of them, and, and any time I get a, uh, somebody else's 251 or, or C12 to evaluate, this is the one I, I, I bring it up against, and everyone seems to love it, and for a lot of the stuff that I do, it tends to be the most appropriate, but then sometimes something else come in and we throw in a different mic, but this gets used so frequently, I just leave it in here. That's fantastic, and 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 we love it on uh, uh, we love it on acoustic guitars too, or overheads. Or I have uh, I, I got an, I wound up with another one that I worked to pair it to to match it with, and sometimes it's on piano or overheads to pair them too. But beautiful. Yeah. What's the history of it? It is it's a Frankenstein, as you know. These things, the 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 the, the plastic in them would go bad. Mm -hmm. And so the internal guts of it uh, are all vintage, but the plastic parts and whatnot are, are the new Telefunken. Uh, and, but it's, you know, it's the old school capsule, all the old, uh, you know, except for there's certain capacitors you want to get rid of, like the ceramic one that gets noisy and whatnot, but every, you know, all the resistors and everything are all, old school and I wound up, uh, because both of them, both of my mics came to me without their power supplies. David Bach made me a historically correct power supply for both of them and uh, that's kind of, that's the deal with these, you know, and you get the, you get the nice old, I was able to keep the nice old, uh, it's my favorite thing about these, come on. Whatever's left of the made in oh. whatever's left of the made in Austria sticker on the back. Wonderful. <laughs> but yeah, always always double check your uh, latch because you don't want to. You don't want that dropping. You don't want it dropping. No. So here's the mic locker, and uh, to me, this is the most important part of recording anything because it's the transducer. Uh, it's the first part of it's the first part of uh, the signal path. Um, I love. I have a thing for M49s. They're my favorite Neumann. We have a few U47s. 
Uh, I love the Sony C C37A, the best Tom mic ever, kind of extravagant as a Tom mic, but you know, that's the way it goes. This is actually a Pape C12. Norbert Pape was a, a guy who had taken a bunch of um, uh, leftover uh, AKG parts and was making mics and, and it, someone had turned me onto it and it sounded great. It doesn't sound exactly like a C12, but it does its own thing and it's very cool. SM23, which is a stereo uh, uh, 56, SM69, which is a stereo M269. We have the M367, which is a, basically a 67 with an AC701. I love 414 EBs with the old CK12 capsules. Um, here we have another another one of the 251s. Or this one's actually a 250. Uh, I love ribbons. We What's have, the difference between the 250 and the 251? Uh, the 250 does not have figure eight, uh, which I find very handy. I'm someone who will go to figure eight frequently in bright mics to make them a little darker. Not just either off axis helps with the darkness or just being a figure eight itself will take some of that top off if there's a certain vocal where it's just a little too edgy. Uh, I love M MD409 Sennheisers. I have a pile of them. Best bass amp, guitar amp, you know, uh, dynamic mic for my money. Uh, I have 421s, which I never use because if anyone who knows me, I hate when people use 421s on toms because then you have to gate them because the cymbals sound like crap. Uh, toms sound great, the cymbals sound awful. My I, just, I just had a whole microphone dinner meeting last night with a microphone company mm -hmm. and all of us at the tables eight of us were mystified why we've ever used 421s for toms it's it, it you know just a it, it just happens somewhere along the way and it's a habit that i like people to get out of because they, they, because people only hear how the tom sounds on it which sounds wonderful but the mm -hmm. off axis is just horrid for symbols, and you wound up having to gate the toms. Uh, in which case, I'd rather put a, dive, uh, a condenser on it, and then yeah. uh, if I'm going to gate it, and then get a condenser on it, exactly. Get snap. Or, or uh, exactly, and then. Or, what do you What do you use on toms? It depends what mood I'm in. I'll use my if I'm here. I'll use the Longevin CR3As. I'll use uh, the 414EBs. I'll use the C37As. Sometimes I'll use Bayer M88s. They have a few of those. Uh, or I'll use uh, AKG D19s. I, I, you know, it's just, it depends what mood I'm in. I can't say there's any particular rhyme, and rhyme or reason why I'll choose one on a particular thing. It's just whatever instinct I have or bug I have up my ass that day. Um, but yeah, and we love, we love D12s on kicks. Right, yeah. Not the D112. <laughs> We don't love the D112, and that's my dog who's unhappy. Oh, and I gotta say, I've been loving these lately. Are you hip to these? Nope. What is that? This is the Telefunken, I think it's the M82, and uh, I was at Steakhouse, and for some reason my D12 was not playing nice with their console, and they had one of these, and I was like, wow, this is a brilliant mic, and it's not that expensive, and it has a ton of low end, and it just sounds really good on a kick mic, so these are good ones. Um, if you're looking what for they called again? The, the Telefunken M82, if you're looking for a M82. new microphone, because the problem with some of these vintage AKGs is they're in various states of disrepair and frequency response. My D12 died. Yeah, and, and no one can fix them, except oh. for Esa Trevala, and he's in, Sw and he's in Switzerland. Um, and uh, so if you're looking for something new, this, is, this has been a really great kick mic. I take pride in this little collection of, these are D19 and D24 uh, AKG mics that I, I have them labeled as to which one, I, you know, I've gone through each one on each thing going, this is the one I like on the rack, Tom. This is, because <laughs> uh, they all have a slightly different frequency response. These are the, you know, people call these the Ringo mic. You see these all over Ringo's kit. And the D24 was essentially the same microphone but when they would, I, my understanding is that when they would test the capsules and figure out which ones really sounded the best, um, they would get put into D24s, which would then get these grills and would become, you know, the main, the professional vocal mic. And you'll see people on TV appearances in the 60s and they're holding these. Like, I, I remember You that. know, Herman's Hermit singing into one of yeah. these. My question is, is are, they, are they more or less expensive than D19s? I think they're about the same. Oh, about the same, okay. Uh, but, you know, I, some, I sometimes you can see them for less. Sometimes, 
I, I bought all mine before Brian Kehoe uh, and Kevin Ryan wrote uh, their recording the Beatles book. And, mm -hmm. and, and before the book, Brian would say, I'm not going to tell you what, but there's stuff you should buy before this book comes out. And he was right. And I had, you know, stock probably is like my 414 EBs. I was buying those all for 800 bucks before people were realizing how great they were, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and, uh, and that's why I have a pile of them. Um, so yeah, I love these, and and some frequently these I always have one of these on a snare, and sometimes I have them on a. Sometimes I'll use them on a tom. Now is that is that like a bronze gold? It's just like a yeah. This was the frequently you'll see the gold one mm -hmm. on. Uh, the gold ones you usually see on the sixty ohm version, which were like the home recording ones where they have the cable already attached, but. This one just, that was how this one was. This is a 200 ohm one, and it may or may not have been, no, it's an AKG. Sometimes you'll see them, you know, marked, they're made, they'll be made for Telefunken or for whomever. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're AKG and sometimes they're Telefunken. But uh, yeah, there's a few of them out there with, I think this one is a hodgepodge of parts, so I think I have a silver one on here with the, but, um, I, you know, and I have about four of them that are just don't work because that's right. and because someone hit them and once they hit them, they're dead and you can't fix them. Um, so is that really the reality, like with the D D12? and those? That's really the reality. There's uh, there's a gentleman in Switzerland who will go in there and rebuild the coil for you and fix them. Other than that, AKG won't service them. And I don't know anybody in the States who is doing it. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer. It, it is. Very yeah. much so. And AKG has no interest in, it's too expensive for them to make. Sure. Yeah, yeah so there you go. Fantastic. It's amazing. Great, so we're in the live room. We're in the live room. Where we cut the horns. So it's, yes, it's a smallish live room, but it is, it's a good sounding live room, and, and I can get great drum sounds in here. And if I need it to sound even bigger, you know, I'll stick a couple of M160s face in the wall and crush them, and then if I need to, I'll put a, you know, SM69 out in the hallway and and right. and get a little space and, and 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 it works great that way. And usually, I'll have drums set up over here. I kind of keep some keyboards set up over here. We have Rhodes and a Mini Moog, which George Duke signed from when he played it one time. Oh wow! And uh, and watching George Duke play a Mini Moog is, you know, it's like watching Picasso paint. Right. It it was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have keep the Hammond like ben, in the club. Benmon on, uh, yeah. on this. Yes. Like you ben watch Mon. Benmon and he like moves like two fingers, but he's doing this. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the draw bars. Yeah. I know what you mean. You're like, oh, that's how you do it. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, it's like, oh, that's what that pitch wheel's for, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I've seen people do it, but never with such facility and just like, mm -hmm. woo, 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 you know, it's just, yeah. you have a virtuoso like George Duke. But, um, yeah. So you like the M160s. I'm a big fan. I don't see them much in America. I mean, coming from uh, Europe in general, they're everywhere. I don't know if I already knew that it was where, when the levee breaks. Uh, I had originally gotten introduced to them as possible guitar amp microphones, mm -hmm. which I never used them on. Yeah. But my, my, uh, my mentor liked them in that, and I, they, I just never cared for them. As a, and by that point, you know, we started having different choices for ribbons on microphones. Mm -hmm. That's Lola. She's, she's unhappy that we're not talking about her. <laughs> um, and and at some I, maybe it was when I found out when the levee breaks and and they're not terribly expensive, cheaper than coals, and the fact that they're directional is helpful. And I found out if you know if I push all four buttons in on an eleven seventy eight, I can pretty much get that compact crush sound, and where it distorts. And the eleven seventy eight, because it has an IC, distorts a little bit better than the eleven seventy six, and you get that. Mm. <laughs> Kind of. Uh, oh, I like you saying that because I always liked eleven seventy eights, and I always yeah. felt like I was an alien liking that. Well, you know what? I, I, I've actually I, I've done a number of records where it was the mix bus compressor and it sounded great. Mm -hmm. I know that Clear Mountain likes them, mm. um, and you know his records sound horrible. Um, <laughs> that is sarcasm. Yeah, sarcasm. <laughs> Bob, I, I worship you, so don't. Uh, <laughs> oh um, no, I'm sure he understood. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> but. Um, 
and yeah, and it's just it, sometimes people get their panties in a bunch because something's not all discreet. Well, sometimes an IC sounds good in a certain position. You know, it, it'll have a certain character. It's like why an SSL sounds great on some records as opposed to an Eve. It'll just it makes the right type of noise that really sits nicely and tight and and. Uh, uh, yeah, 1178s do a great job with that. That sometimes where an 1176 doesn't, and and it's, it's it's shortcomings are sometimes what makes that preferable. But they're both great, you know. Just Absolutely. Horses for courses. Horses Absolutely. for courses. You may have heard me say that. <laughs> what have we got up here? Oh, these are Lucas CS ones. Ah, oh, yeah, I've, I've met these guys. They're great. My my uh, dearly departed friend. Uh, Oliver Arcutt had designed these in conjunction with Terry Manning, uh, who is oh, a wow. legendary uh, engineer producer, also a friend of mine. And the idea was, it's you just you're just revealing something that nobody's told me because that's Lucas Lucas. I mean, Lucas. Like the Lucas EQs that Terry used yes. to make are some of the best sounding EQs. Dave Jordan used to have those, yes. named after his son Lucas. Yeah, I, so I didn't know that was. I just thought it was another yes. company called Lucas. Yeah, so. I'm funny stuff. Uh, so Oliver had done basically, it's funny, if you look at the circuit, the circuit is essentially the same circuit as a 47, but he took the um, MBHO Hahn C capsule that David Bach uses in his 251, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds very nice, and, and found a tube that he could get abundant or, you know, an abundant amount of, so mm -hmm. that it, you could have service forever, and, a, and an excellent tube that no one was using in anything that he just happened to find, and then designed his own transformer. And so it winds up sounding somewhere between a 251 and an M49. It has a tremendous amount of low end, that, and, and it's super, super quiet. And uh, these are pretty much, at least here, these are my go-to for overheads. That's wonderful. Uh, and, and they're great. Um, and they just kind of live in here because it's just the easiest place. Do you have a deceiver? Because I wrote to him a few years ago and I really wanted a deceiver. And I think he wasn't doing a run then. Yeah, I know. I know about the deceiver. I do not have one. But um, I, they, I, I, I know people who love them. Oh, yeah. Uh, D Dave used to have them when he would be running, when he was doing all those big rock records in the late 80s and early 90s, right. he would have like five or six rigs all mic'd up. And the deceiver could like, you know, he could, he could literally audition things in nanoseconds, flip the polarity, right. you know, just keep everything completely isolated. And, and, and my understanding is the deceiver was a device where you could si send a line level or any type level signal to an amplifier and it would deceive it into thinking that it's coming off an instrument, but it would have the exactly. proper impedance as though it were coming off yeah. a guitar or something. And so, Very smart. Yeah. So. I had a few email exchanges with Terry about that, Hence so I'm deceiver. excited. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, and Terry's a, Terry's a sweetheart and a really wonderful guy and very, very, you know, been very, very generous to me. He gave me his old Eventide uh, Insta Flanger and Insta Phaser. Uh, wow. And um, that came out of Compass Point. Uh, and, 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 but just a really, really sweet guy who is just so generous with his time and information to anyone who wants to ask him about, like, there are certain things I know he's kept secret in terms of like, it'll wind up in the book and you'll have to buy the book and find out about it. But anytime I've gone like, I've said like, Hey, what's that? What was that amp on this one ZZ Top song? How do you get, and he'll, and he'll tell me, I'm like, that's why it sounds like that. Never would have thought of that, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. So. We're in the living room uh, be, where the piano lives because my tracking room is too small. But we have tie lines that come up to here for headphones and microphones. And uh, beautiful. I uh, wound up getting this nice C7 I love in C7s. 95, and it's wound up on many, many records. I love C7s. They're just like, they always deliver. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and then uh, this is where the acoustics and the arch tops live. Uh, in, the, uh, in my mid-40s, I realized I need to start growing up and learning to play jazz a little better. And 
<laughs> and nothing makes you play jazz better than an arch top with flat wound 12s on it. I, I love these kind of things, but they're uh -huh. a little big and unwieldy. Right. This is like the perfect, because it's sort of a 335, but it's a little deep. Well, well, and the idea too with the small scale neck was so, uh, uh, I can't remember who, was it Charlie Bird? I don't, I don't the guy who that Birdland was named after. Oh, okay. The guitar player. Um, it, the idea was so that you could have, that you could grab jazz chords more easily. Right. For me, it's difficult because I have these enormous hands that I hate playing anything above the 12th fret. Really. Yeah, I hear you. But. Uh... Oh, it's gorgeous. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, that's like the most perfect size jazz guitar I've ever played. Absolutely gorgeous. And what year is that? That's a 1960. Wow. Fabulous. Now, what is that strange looking thing? That, that is a replica of Jerry Garcia's wolf oh, that okay. I had made. I, uh, and uh, I don't know anything about a Grateful Dead. Growing up in England. Yeah, yeah. It's, you have to you either love him or you hate him. And as a kid, that was the guitar I dreamed of having. But the, the real one sold for something like $1.7 million <laughs> last year. And I, I just don't have that kind of money to throw away. <laughs> Here's the, this is cool. I, when when I you're wanted, not Bill Gates? Um, when I wanted to buy my first jazz box, yeah, I had a certain amount of money and I went down to the Vintage Guitar Show and this guy was willing to sell me this for that amount of money. And it's, it's a 1947 Epiphone uh, Zephyr Regent. But the cool part about it is, this not only can you tell by the wear, was this a gigging guitar. The guy has a set list from whatever, oh, and you have so you have like Midnight Sun, uh, Cherokee, A Train, you know, like all these. Oh, it's so good. And that's my favorite part about this guitar, is that uh, the guy had a set list on the back, and he was obviously a you know a gigging guitar player, and and. You would just flip over and well, go, like, oh, and polka, dot, polka dots and moonbeams in, uh, in D minor. I've seen, uh, I've seen photos, not in the flesh, of uh, Paul McCartney's Hofner, where he mm. has the set list written on there. Right. And Tal Barkman as well has his dad's guitar. Oh, funny. As well. yeah, I love that kind of stuff. It almost makes you want to do it to something, but then, of course, you know, who's going to care about my guitar? Yeah. I love this. I'm very, very excited. I, see, in England, um, Polytone was like a little bit of an elusive thing. They didn't really get over there very much. And I worked in this music store and um, they had like the little Polytone bass amps because they're made locally, weren't they? And, and they're just fantastic, super clean, must be amazing on jazz guitar. They are. And that was why I got it. You know, I think I bought it for like 250 bucks or something and, uh, and it's great. And it's because you want, for jazz, you want something that doesn't distort. You mm -hmm. want it to be very clean and, and, and have a nice brightness available to it. Yep. Um, they're beautiful. And uh, you can you can find polytones for cheap because they're just out there and it's like and and it's not like Well not anymore, but you could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not anymore. This is true. Now they're... No, they are in England they were very coveted because they, I don't believe I could be wrong, uh, the English uh, or the British Viewers can tell me. I, I think for long periods of time they didn't have any distribution in England. Yes. And so they we would buy a guitar player and we'd see like a, a great jazz guitar player and he'd be sitting there next to his polytone and we'd be like, well, I want that. Even without hearing it, you just wanted it because you right. knew the association. Oh, by the way, the other thing is that I collect that I got a <laughs> vintage guitar straps. There were yeah. two main makers of the what they call the hippie straps. This is like the type that, this is the exact type that uh, Hendrix used at Woodstock. It's the Red Saugerties Ace. Oh, and, wow. And Ace and Bobby Lee, and then uh, this Japanese brand called Kingston. All right, and then I get in, I get into like my whole weird OCD thing, like, okay, all the jazz boxes all have to have the Bobby Lees with this pattern, oh, except they're all in a different color. And then, <laughs> and I just got the thing where all my guitars all have to have a vintage strap on them that have to like look good with the, and you just go nuts with it. And now, uh, we're just big kids, though. We got We're into just music. Big, we got it. yeah. But it's if you're gonna if if you're gonna you know want to go nuts on something, straps are a lot cheaper than guitars. Uh, <laughs> they can get expensive. You need to spend like hundred bucks on a strap, but it's but much, it's hundred bucks. Not it's not 5, yeah. It's not yeah. Ten thousand. 
What have you got lurking over here? A Taylor, a we Martin. A, we have a Taylor that actually winds up on records more than any other guitar. That doesn't surprise me. I use Yamaha's more than I use. It's a Taylor guitar. 710 I bought in. Uh, a Taylor 710 that I bought in like '92 or something. It's it, even when it's in tune, it sounds even better. But this is the strummer. This is the strummer that just glues the song together. And if you and and like when you're doing acoustic, what a friend of mine likes to call tuned percussion, you know, because sometimes acoustic plays the function of say a tambourine or something and, the, and you're, it's just the percussion instrument in a track. This is just the one that just always sits really great. And uh, I like it. Yeah. It was like my... natural compression to it as well. When you play it hard, it just keeps it very even. Yeah. So you can pick it up with a little mic, but it's very even. Here's the... It is definitely a strum, it's that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So, so this is guitar. fun. This is a 68 J200. So the yeah. thing about 68 is they went to brass saddles. Oh, well. Which have a particular sound. And it's a sound we know very well because it wound up on a record that went. Oh, really? You know, and it sounds just like it. It's, it's, it but sounds it's, it's, just it's, like it. It yeah. sounds, you know, and it, and, and uh, it's a nice, you know, it's a sound that just kind of like cuts right through sometimes, and that's I think that's why Pete Townsend gravitated to these ones with the uh, with with the the brass saddles because it's it was aggressive and 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 was a little more rock than everything Definitely, else yeah. that was going on. No, it's amazing. Uh, I see a Guild 12 string. Love the Guilds, yeah. but and. Uh, a, a beautiful looking Martin, but what is the grammar? Grammar, uh, these were made in Nashville. Uh, Ampeg wound up buying them eventually. These were kind of the grand old Opry guitar. You, everyone in Nashville was playing these. Uh, yeah, the guitars aren't staying in tune around here lately, but. Uh, <laughs> That's quite right. Um, and it's a really lovely piece of Brazilian rosewood on the back. And a friend of mine got me hip to them. He said, you know, these are the sleepers. You should buy one. And, and they never took off like he projected. But they're, they're just lovely made guitars. And uh, they have a nice little piece of history. Johnny Cash had a signature one at one point. That's very country. I love that a lot. Yeah, it's got a real mid-range punch. Good for good for like yeah. arpeggios and articulation. Yeah, it's 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 in the dreadnought vibe. Yeah, definitely gorgeous. Okay. And what is the what is the Martin? That's a I think it's a '69 D35 that. It was something that became available to me for a very nice price, and the D35 is what all the, you know, the majority of the Zeppelin stuff was a D35. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But, um, except for Stairway, which was played on whatever that cheap. Uh, what was that? I, somebody told, oh, um, Spanish sounding name, wasn't it? It's like a harmony, it's like a harmony or something. Oh, it's, it's something, yeah. I'd love to remember. Some, some, some cheap Sears guitar, and that's, that's the sound of Stairway. Yep, and then a couple of Dobros here. Yeah. They both look very old. No, one's actually a 90s one, and the old, other one is a 30s. So this is the 90s one? Yeah. They've done a great work, great job of making this age, though, this pearl here with the, yeah. with the logo. Looks beautiful. Yeah, the mother of toilet seat just kind of turns nice <laughs> and yellow. Uh, yeah, and the other one's a, 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 a style O. Uh, actually, I need to get the neck reset on that. Gorgeous. Who do you use? I'm going to go to Norik Renson. I'll give you a high five for that one. <laughs> he gets name checked all the time. Norik's the best. <laughs> He's the best. Yeah. yeah. And you Norik's don't work. wait five years for your stuff. Like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I have. 
He's, he, he, he's weird because, and not to underplay the guy's the best in the business, but he's also not very expensive. Yeah. It's, very affordable. Yeah, you, you, yeah, it's, they're good there. Yeah, really good. Yeah. I like them. Uh, and I love just hanging out and talking guitars with him. <laughs> look, let's look at some electric guitars. Let's look at some electrics. All right, so this is, this is Warren Paradise Room. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in my teenage years, I started getting into vintage Gibsons. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that uh, things that I bought then were going to become my retirement fund. But, uh, <laughs> but that's basically, uh, this, is, this is the first really choice guitar I ever bought, which is a, a 63 reverse Firebird 7 that, uh, you know, I, I had been looking at the De Choisier Gibson book and just going, that's the coolest looking guitar. And I had mm. gone, been going to the local guitar store going, let me know if you ever get one of these. And they called me up and said, Hey, this guy wants to buy a tailor and he'll trade one in. And if you just pay us for the price of the tailor, you can have it. I'm like, done, you know. Um, that was a good deal. Yeah. So, I, <laughs> and, uh, and then th that kind of started me on the road. Uh, and some of these, this is the guys at uh, Echo Park just made this for me. It's a Carina Firebird with like, I put vintage PAFs in it. I heard he just moved, he moved town, didn't he? He moved to, yes. He, he, uh, he moved to Detroit. <laughs> But I wanted something that had the sound of Karina without uh, the being a V or an Explorer, which are kind of uncomfortable. Okay. Absolutely. I'm, I'm coveting, before we go keep going on the Gibsons, I'm yes. coveting these telecasters down there. Ah, well, these are, okay. <clears throat> the only one of these that's actually vintage is this 69, which is really lovely. The only one of these that's actually vintage is this 69. Uh, but last year, Joe Bonamassa had lent me Terry Reed's old 53 because mm -hmm. I was doing this gig with Terry Reed and he wanted like to... You know. Authentic. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and, I, and I was like, oh, that's what a black guard's all about. That's mm. why people love these things. So I went and I found a um, 52 lap steel pickup for much cheaper than you can buy, but it's the same pickup and you mm -hmm. just change the back. Oops, here we go. And this is how we relic guitars. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I had an old Firebird pickup, which I love in the necks on these things. And I, I, I finished guitars myself. And I did this finish and uh, just bought some parts. And it sounds, and I've A-beat it next to uh, 53s. And it sounds just like it. Tellies you can do that with. Harder with Gibsons, but Tellies you can do right. that with. Uh, and here's a little B-bender I made myself last year. because So you can get your full Bubba on. Even, yeah. even put the Keith, you know, tuner. You know, nice. got that whole thing going. Uh, and then you have the Keith drop D tuner. So when you, right. want, when you want to go full Bubba. And um, that's what's going on in Tallyland over here. That's I, beautiful. I, I like me some chicken picking. Yeah, me too. And, and and nothing does it like a Telly. So we, so, we keep going on the Gibsons. Yeah. Sorry to divert you onto Telly. No, no. <laughs> Again, Pete Townsend. It's the whole reason for that. 69, mm -hmm. it's like he played these things up till 71. This is the sound of live at Leeds through right. at High Watt. It's the nice uh, 62, still called a Les Paul at that point with the ebony block. We have a 58, which I've had for a long time. Another, wow. This is called, I call this one Francis, the, the, the Frankenburst because made up of everything on it is 59, you know, this is like a 61 fretboard Everything on it is 59 correct, came from some 59 guitar, but the wood is not 59. But uh, Roman Wrist, who made all the Max, Les Pauls with Max, made this for me with one of the original Max uh, templates. This is a 53 I converted. We got a 57 TV. Beautiful. A 62 that used to belong to Joe Lewis Walker that has been road hard and put up wet. 330? Yeah. Can I see that? Oh, yeah. Big 330. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I could play those puzzles all day, but it's, oh, I love these. My mentor in England was a guy called Ollie Orcott, and he played a 330. Oh. It's a blues machine, and, and, and it doesn't want you to play any in between pretty notes. It, it wants to fight you, and. and uh, Gorgeous. 
And this is great. This is a 61 that used, to, kid. that used to belong to one of the greatest guitar players who ever lived, and it's an embarrassment that I own it because I suck in comparison to him. This was one of Ted Green's guitars. Oh. Yeah. And if you've ever studied jazz, uh, Ted wrote a uh, instrumental uh, book on on all the great on on guitar harmony that all the great guitar players have played or have learned from. And um, but it's really really wonderful sounding guitar, and it's some it's sometimes my favorite guitar. Frequently my favorite guitar. Absolutely gorgeous. I like Gibsons. Gibsons are easier for me to play. Just right. there's something about. You know, it, gorgeous. You can get away with more. And we have a picture of you playing this downstairs. Yeah, I know, with blonde hair. With blonde hair. I'm gonna take a picture of the picture. And uh, and yeah, and we have basses, just enough different basses for different bass flavors. Gorgeous. And I have a fun-looking guitar, of course, yeah. a Hofner there, which is. This is. I think this is. I bought this from. Um, Greg from the Wallflowers, and oh, yeah. I believe this is the base on the big record. Right. He was like, uh, I'll sell it for 400 bucks. I want to get a, I'm like, great, perfect. The other the other $400 base, this Hoffner, which someone. So, that was a good 400 yeah, It was a good 400 bucks. The uh, Ampeg looks, I've never seen yeah. a fretless version like that. Yeah. I don't, in fact, I've ever seen very few Ampeg Well, versions. you know, Rick Danko in the band, here we go, Rel more relicking happening. Uh, Rick Danko played the fretless version, but he had the he had the one with the transducer with the tail that stuck. Oh, out. right, you're right. I, I recognize that. That's a crazy looking thing. But I'm it, not going to embarrass myself and play fretless. Yeah, yeah. Tony Franklin was here. We could give it to him. Um, and then we have a 1960 Epiphone Rivoli, also known as the Gibson EB2, uh, which is fun. And then um, you know a monkeys type Gretsch. I like hollow body basses. They have like especially when you play them with a pick. They just mm -hmm. have like a mm -hmm. weird thing. I, I like them too. And a tiny bit of plate reverb in the background. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Beautiful. Brave man putting reverb on a bass. Love Remember that? I don't know if you read Jeff Emmerich's book. And he talks about like sneaking a bit of reverb on McCartney's bass. McCartney hearing it, taking it off, and then putting it back on again. Here's a funny story. I, 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 speaking of Beatles engineers, I just ran into Ken Scott, who's a lovely, wonderful person, and I'm working with a band who we'll, we will not name, but they, they did their last record with Ken. And Ken put a C12 on the bass, and the bass player said, are you sure we should be putting a C12 on the bass? And Ken said, it's what I do on Paul McCartney. End of, end of discussion. <laughs> Yeah, and, Ken, and so, Ken's a sweetheart, so he probably just said it in an offhand way. Yes. Oh, I, I used to do it on Paul McCartney. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> Gorgeous. But that, that's a good way to end a discussion. Yeah, that's what we did on the White Album. Right. Okay, <laughs> enough said. Um, I, 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 wish, I wish I could say one of the, I had one of those like, bomb droppers to go like, end discussion. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I did on Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> Next question. Um, um, that's gorgeous. What is that? That is a 68 uh, non-reverse Thunderbird 1 yep. bass. Uh, just part of more of my Who fetish. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you want to do that sort of quadrophenia type bass sound, you're going to have to go into Thunderbird land. Right. And uh, it's it was one that just, I was working on a record and it kind of wound, you know, wandered into my life at a very reasonable price, and I bought it and Wonderful. wound up all over record. And, Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of these instruments or you know, pieces of gear they usually involve. There was some record where it happened. It's like, oh, we need that. Oh, here's one. It's a great. It's a great deal. Let's grab it. It's amazing. It's hard to gloss over this. You're saying this is a '58. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's that's probably a big part of your retirement fund, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was funny. Everyone thought I was crazy when I spent eight thousand dollars on it. You know, like I wish I could buy a bunch of them for eight thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, the other part of my retirement fund, you'll get to play downstairs, which is the the sixty. Yes, sir. Which is that's Mint. that's the it's very nice, uh, and yeah, and that was, you know, and and I, I can actually play guitars. I can't play my stocks. <laughs> 
right. they don't make a sound. And so I enjoy it. And uh, God forbid, you know, I have to cash in on the insurance policy on them or anything. But uh, it's uh, it, it and and every almost everything gets used on record. Mm -hmm. And and frequently someone will have a part, and I go like, I know I know what you know. I know which guitar and which amplifier, or I know which keyboard or whatever will, will really work for that part, or mm -hmm. which guitar will work on that song. And so, you know, they're, they're tools that all, aside from the fetishistic part of it, they're really tools that have a place and, and uh, make my life easier in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to the mix when I'm tracking. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and, 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 and I want to know, okay, well, if I use this guitar, it's going to step on the vocal. Or if we use this guitar, it's not going to step on, you know, that, that type of thing, so. Wonderful. This is a uh, 1960 Les Paul that's in very nice condition. It, it basically had one owner, um, and he was kind enough to sell it to me. Uh, and you were commenting on the neck. It's funny. Some people don't, you know, 1960, they went to the slimmer neck, and some people don't like it, but the English guys preferred it. Clapton, Page, those guys, they like the slimmer neck. I think it makes them a little snappier. Um, it sort of turns it into, you know, it's, it's still a blues guitar. like. <laughs> But it's also, if you want it to be, it's a yeah. shredding guitar because it's got yeah. this, almost like a Paul Reed Smith kind of slinky neck. Yeah, it's a very, very playable guitar. And, and they do this thing, this one in particular, you know, does this thing where there's like a mid-range bloom. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, you can see why they were so popular in the 70s. You don't need a pedal. You just plug it into an amp and it just kind of sustains and sings. Uh, they're Speaking of playable. what, what do we have there, amp-wise? This is a 53 Deluxe that was converted to 12 AX7s, so it has sort of that crunch of the later, uh, you know, square-faced ones. Listen to the sustain. <laughs> Vintage Les Pauls, they, you know, they, they're class, they're either barkers or, or biters or moaners. This is more the moaner, you know, where the, where the top end, where the top end isn't super sharp, but it just has that really nice, it, it remi you know, it reminds me a lot of uh, the McTaylor guitar uh, called the Claw, that, uh, or Claw, that is, he played with the Stones. It really has that kind of, you know, round, smooth top end. It's gorgeous. Yeah, the, the bridge pickup is the one I really like on this one. That's insane. Yeah, and you can see we're, like, we're, we're yeah, and we're we're going. We have. It's not that loud. No, and we it's, have we we, we have the amp on twelve o'clock. You know, it just it just does a. talking about Bonamassa, I'm surprised he hasn't tried to buy it off you. No, it, it's funny, this got offered to him first and he passed on it and he tells me that this was the the last good deal on a Les Paul. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I keep in touch with the with the original owner, and we 
we chat on Facebook a bunch. He's a really great musician and a sweetheart. So it's nice to oh, you know gorgeous. keep the. I, I I hope I'm making him happy, but you know it's hard to let go of something that's like this that's been part of your life since you were a teenager. You know, we've had it for a long time. Uh, well, he had it since oh, he was a teenager. Right. Yeah, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can talk over it. It's not loud. This guitar has sustain for days. I mean, with this kind of sustain, normally I'd have so much gain, yeah. but now this is special. You promised me it would be. You were correct. I was, yeah. Ever, you know, it's one of those things. It's it's not like Niagara Falls where you go like, oh, is that all there is? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's one. It's one of those ones where you're like, oh, okay, it's just. It's as special as, you know, yeah. I hoped it would be. So I was very lucky in that regard. Gorgeous. Oh. So if it's missing off the wall, it wasn't me. <laughs> it's going back in the safe when you leave. That's yeah. a, where it lives. All right, can we start from the top and work our way down? What is that? Okay, that is an Echoplex Bandmaster. Uh, it's basically a four channel mixer and Echoplex that uh, I had found somewhere for cheap one of those days and, mm -hmm. you know, and when you need a, when you need an echo plex type echo, it, it it's great, and it has line level. Which I, is I've also actually helpful. never used one of those. I have a traditional, obvious looking uh -huh. one. This one's a, new to me. Yeah, that's a heck of a VU. Right? Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> we we like Frankenstein looking shit in the studio. So yeah. big VUs are always a plus. Um, it is funny you talk about Frankenstein you, when you watch some of these uh, old movies. They are, they're using audio equipment because it looks like, yeah. and you're like, oh, they're adjusting a Fairchild. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we, we want, something that looks impressive as well as sounds impressive. So big, big views are great in the studio because people are like, ooh, it must sound good. It has a big meter. Um, it definitely looks good. I'm sure it sounds good yeah. too. Pair of Helios, very beautiful. Yeah, these are, we have a couple of, these are sort of on semi-permanent loan to me. These are original Basing Street modules, which are amazing. And, you know, they're that type of thing where they sound really good when you go like this and you turn shit all the way. That's when it sounds better. Not everything turns sounds great when you sure. really go to extremes with it. But they're not mine and they're really expensive. But I found some of these Tony Arnold one ma uh, made Tony Arnold made ones for quite cheap. And they are close enough that I'll be very happy with them. And I actually found some. Uh, original modules that need a lot of work that when these get taken from me I'll be able to still have them but it's, it's just amazing it sounds like you, you you know you just you put a 409 on an amp you know you, you come back 4 dB on the 10k and you go to like 2.8 or 3.5 and you like crank it all the way and you're like oh it sounds like a Rolling Stones record I wonder why because this was what was in the you know Rolling Stones mobile truck uh -huh. so um, and that's basically it. It's fantastic. Here we have 12 uh, Longevin AM16s, which I love. I actually think they sound a little nicer than uh, Neves even, but it's a, it's a classic discrete design made by a guy named John Hall, who is now dead, who was an audio legend and genius. And there's actually not any capacitors in the, uh, in, in the path. Um, wow. So uh, it's a solid state thing with a, excellent transformer and Steve Furlot, who was another genius of an inward connections and uh, tree audio put his uh, John Hall designed uh, op amp stereo bus in this so I can either go direct out or send it through the bus and you know pan it uh, and it's wonderful and this, I do this I, I put my snare in generally so I'll, I, I like to some snare I just it drives me nuts when I have three separate snare tracks printed or I, I do three mics on a snare and uh, and I come out through that, and um, that, that's my snare sound, and, and a bunch of other things. They're just wonderful. So it's a really nice, discreet uh, op amp or, or mic pre to, to use on everything. Um, we have Amazing. we have some Trident B range stuff. Uh, the guys at Purple Audio at one point they took a bunch of B range modules and racked them up into this stuff, and I had another spare one which I put in a rack with a uh, 
Day King module, 33. Which is based on the A range. Whatever, yeah, which is also based on the A range. With the, 50, the, the 52270, which was the birth date of his son, I believe. That's where we come up with our, our model numbers and stuff. Um, and I just love tridents. You know, it's the, it's the sound of rock. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it was all kind of based off the Sound Techniques console, but the EQ is just great. And if you want a rock guitar, or, you know, think of Queen records and stuff. Absolutely. What do you feel the differences between the A and the B? I've never been able to well, shoot them the, out. Well, the A has, this is, this doesn't sound exactly like an A, but it does a lot of the things. Part of the, the thing with the A is, or the Tridents is the Zut Transformer. But the A allows you to do one very cool thing, which is overlap frequencies. And mm -hmm. so you start getting that parasitic thing where you're going to put, you know, you're going to, pull at 2K and push at 1K and do weird shit. And, 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 and it just does strange things that you can't do with the B because you have just fixed frequency shelves on the top and bottom. And then you have uh, your mid. Uh, and why did they change? It, it's cheaper to do this, um, honestly. It's, okay. I think it's less maintenance. It's, it's, it's cheaper to do that. And I think they were going for a, a, a the B range was a less expensive console, but Absolutely. a lot of the Bowie, you know, mid late 70s stuff was done on a B range. Um, and uh, they're great, you know, and, 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 and the thing that differentiated Trident from, say, Neve and API was they were going with a 48 volt rail, which was double what Neve was doing and, and what API is 18 or something. And, and they, were, they were able to have a tremendous amount of headroom. Mm -hmm. And they also, there was something that gave them much more bandwidth so that everything sounded much more open and, and higher fidelity. Sure. So on top of the fact that the, the EQs had this tremendous character and the, and the, the pre's sounded great. Uh, it, it, a lot of people who worked on them just felt that they were a much more hi-fi console. Mm. And uh, Well, when we were at NAMM, I mean, uh, uh, Ken Scott was waxing lyrically about the sound techniques having that mm -hmm. huge dynamic range. Yeah, and, that, and, and, and the sound techniques was in Trident Studios, mm -hmm. and they decided to make their own console, and they kept calling sound techniques going, can you send us a bunch of those transformers? So they were kind of ripping off their design and making mm -hmm. their own console, and finally... Sound techniques got wise, but, <laughs> but only 13 A ranges were ever made. Uh, That's amazing. Okay, so a, a, a mixture of some BAE, some Neve. Yeah, some um, vintage Neve, some Shep. Oh, the Sheps, okay. Yeah, which, oh, which, yeah. which sound wonderful. Um, and, uh, and right now we have some of the new Rupert Neve 5052s because I'm, I'm getting a new console that will be half of this and half of this. Great. And I did, uh, I was recording things, molting, and I had to tell you, I was so incredibly impressed with the red silk function, function dialed, yeah. dialed in at 50%. Uh, you could basically null the vintage Neves in this. But the only difference was this had about 8 dB more headroom and better transient. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, the, you know, it's the similar type EQ, it doesn't sound exactly like the Neve EQ, but which is why I will have half and half of both. But it's great when you don't, when you want to have the ability to do something clean or dirty it, or you can dial in much more saturation to the transformer uh, and get more harmonic distortion, you also have that ability. So I was really, really super impressed with uh, what what Rupert Neve Designs is doing, and it was a no-brainer to go like, oh, if I need a new console, um, class A transformer balanced all over the place, I think this will be a, a smart thing. So Wonderful. Yeah. V78s? V78s are the same as V72s, but the, uh, I believe the uh, transformer is wired in series as opposed to parallel or something. You're supposed to get more gain. So the V78 became something that was intended to be used for ribbon microphones. So, you, so you had more gain. Uh, these were worked on by Oliver Arcutt, who put a little negative feedback circuit in to do attenuation. Uh, and then I, this is, <laughs> this is one of those old Rhino um, hot swappable drive bays. I don't oh, know if you wow. remember these. I do. And, and I had the thing sitting around. It was like so... And and wow. and I had and I had somebody machine them so that I could uh, 
fit the V72s in them, and it already had the the whole AC I situation. That, the hot swap it all. Yeah, and then I just uh, and then I just uh, put you know this was like a little weekend project I did where I just bought some pots and 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 looked at a friend of mine who had a V72 rack and just stole the circuit and built this uh, and put it into here. Wow, and this is an this is an old looking three twelve four. It is, and I and I um put uh, phase and the uh, phantom on the front, or there were you know there was no phase, so I, I I put a little phase switch on it, and the phantoms on the back, which is sort of inconvenient, of these old ones. Um, yeah, I think this is an '80s one or something. Yeah, these are great. Yeah. Um, a nice selection of 500 series here. Yeah, I some of the old 550As. Yes. And uh, we like. I remember the heart console that's in uh, Seattle is this color. Right. Yeah, the white ones are cool, and I love 560Bs for uh, for mixing. These have always. I do too. I've always loved these for 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 kick drum, mm -hmm. for toms, <laughs> for bass. Uh, you know, that's generally what I. You know, I'll sum my. I have one one of my kick, one of my snare. Yeah. Yeah, great on snare too. I'll I'll sum. Uh, uh, you know the di and uh, amp into one thing when i'm mixing and just run it through that and just that's, that's do, smart i should do that do whatever notching i do and and 512s are great and yep. th then we have our lovely poltex yeah and these are steve jackson's ones they are steve jackson's poltex which i think sound amazing i have not done a direct ab but people that i trust have and uh and i have a friend who sold his vintage uh Poltex and kept these, which should tell you something. Yep. Um, we have the same friend. Yes. And uh, and these are the mastering version, so they have the detented. Those are great. I have yeah. a mastering pair on my yeah. on which, my yeah. bus. It so, makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. As you can see, I like to put them on my overheads. Beautiful. Um, and uh, and then and then when I'm mixing, you know, it it, it is frequently on my uh, on my mix bus. That's wonderful. Absolutely beautiful. And are you using a 40 on your mix bus? Mm, let's see, what are we doing on this one? Uh, uh, I don't know what I don't know what I had this on recently. Sometimes a bit sometimes I'll I'll do I'll add a little, you know, 30 or 40 if I want to put a little ass in something. That's where I'll do sure. it. I like I'm one of those people I like to take out um, I like to take out uh, you can see because everything also goes through my uh, EQ, my NTI. Yep. And as you can notice, I notch out 160 because I always find that spot between 100 to 175 is where civilian speakers get really unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can notch that out by a dB and make it sound much better on somebody's home system without mm -hmm. it sacrificing the music. And then I give it to a mastering guy and he never has to touch the low end. So That's great. Uh, and this is one of the early... if. These are just amazing because they're they're so phased. I don't know them at all. They are uh, they came out it's in completely the nineties. They are so incredibly phase linear, and the cue is so wide that and and it's these presets frequencies, but it has this air band which is forty k, uh, and you can unlike say using a GML EQ where you're just really going to do horrible things with the phase if you do too much, you can just move stuff up a db or two and and really make a mix sound very close to mastered uh and and not do any detriment to the the phase and it's broad enough that you're not going to make it difficult for your mastering guy to great get things back in the ballpark that's wonderful do you find a quick question because you boost say boosting 40 there are you um maybe shelving uh, well like maybe high passing right up to that point then boosting afterwards because it creates a nice curve uh not really yeah you what know? Are you, how are you using it i don't i don't do i don't do much high passing you don't no um it just kind of depends. I it, it's a it's a. Are you a, doing it at source? If you are high passing, just putting on your mic. Yeah, that's if I'm high passing, it'll be. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I high pass, it tends to be on the thing that has the low end information I want. Right. I'll do a lot of high passing in the mix, you know, and I think that's something that I learned from listening to Chris Lord Algae mixes. Mm -hmm. When I started noticing, he he did a friend of mine's record. He did the single and the guy who produced it the rest, and I'm like, oh, why does this? 
why does the Chris Lord LG1 sound this much better than everything else? And I noticed it's like, oh, I can really hear all the instruments. And I started noticing like, man, he's really not afraid to high pass stuff. Right. You know, so that the bass sits here, but this other stuff sits here and mm -hmm. it's not all overlapping. And, and so I'm, uh, I don't think my mixes sound much like Chris Lord LG mixes, but I, I, I really appreciate that about you know the separation and tightness of his yeah. mixes and, and 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 i really learned it's like oh the bass can handle the bass and, and back again to uh, per perception you'll perceive the low end in a guitar because of the bass the low end doesn't we don't have to record down to 100 hertz on the guitar right you know, like the, as long as the bass is playing something similar you, re you you perceive all this low end in the guitar that's really just there because the bass is playing it and and now you have room for the vocal in between the two Right. You know, so that's 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 kind of how I handle high pass if we're going to go down that rabbit hole. So what is this? This limiter? I that mean. is that is the GE uh, B9A1 limiter, which is this is what the gates stay level is based on. Ah. It's a pair of six V6s with the 6386 in between the two. Yeah. Uh, if you change the transformer, you could make a guitar amp out of it. <laughs> um, uh, literally, I mean, these. I think these were used in radio stations where you had to send the signal far away to a transmitter or something. But it's it's uh, this is what the stay level came from. I was at a mastering session. Some guy came in. They were you know they were like in little modular pieces. The guy came in. He's like, hey, do you want this for two hundred bucks? I was like, sure. And I gave it another thing that Steve for a lot racked up for me. Uh, and they're awesome. And they just make things big and huge. And I like to use them. Like when, when I'm not mixing in the box, which is almost never anymore, I like these on parallel compression on the kick and snare and they just, and you just crush the crap out of it and you, and it mm. just, you know, brings up interesting things to, to go along with uh, your dry signal. I'd love to hear it at some stage. Yes. I'm going to come back here and track. Yes. What we're going to do. So inward connections. Yes. Uh, this is my go-to vocal chain always. These are the VAC rack mic pre. Uh, they're 6072 based with no output transformer, input transformer, no output transformer, same with their compressor. Uh, just stupid amount of headroom. Um, someone will peg, you know, the, the, the thing I've always bums me out about using like 1073s uh, on vocals is just the headroom's kind of wonky and someone sings a note too loud and then it sounds like that and you get that overmodulation. Never run into overmodulation on these, they're so crystal clear. And these are an opto, but it's an LED opto, so it's a lot faster. So you don't, like in LA-2A, the problem is it's slow enough that the sibilance comes through. And if you're digging in hard, the sibilance gets louder. These are fast enough that it catches the sibilance, but it has a really, really great compression, compression characteristic. And somehow he managed, maybe it's because it's transformless, I don't know. When you hit it really hard, it doesn't bring up the harmonic distortion as compressors do. Mm. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be a geek and I'll sit around, I'll run a sine wave through all my compressors to see what type of harmonic compression is coming up. And then, you know, you run 1K in and whether it's bringing up even or odd, the more compression, you, you know, you look in a spectrum analyzer and you start seeing two and four coming up. Mm -hmm. And you can dig in harder on these and you get the lowest levels of, of harmonic content of any compressor I own, which uh, is either a good thing, which in my case it is, because I'll usually want to table that coloration for mixing. Mm -hmm. But occasionally you're hearing someone, you're like, oh, I need to go into 1176 or something and mm -hmm. hear like more like grind out of them. But uh, it's just remarkably consistent. Again, like I said, the headroom is remarkable and that's really important. And he, also, and he also made a passive tube EQ where he used all the uh, EQ points of the 550A. And... Um, and they sound fantastic. You can see I like it on snare a lot and, and anything else. Oh, you've got to listen, bro. This is one of, <laughs> this, well, he, he, yes, it's, this is one of Hugo's <laughs> first ones, but he mm -hmm. did in gray and then he was afraid Abbey Road would give him a hard time. So he did him in green and he sold it to me. Um, and then I found a carcass of a 436C mm -hmm. and I took out the transformers and I put them in so that I had like the original, uh, uh, I forgot who makes, the, who makes the transfer, but that's the thing with, that's really the only thing that they kept in Abbey Road. Right. And of course I threw, because you know, once again, the important D, you know, VU meter, we uh, put the Altec meter back on and I, uh, and, and I had to go with the real Dymo labeling. 
um, just to make it. I, I, I have mine modded. Um, God rest his soul, Steve Anderson modded mine. Right. Love yeah. Steve. 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 <laughs> Steve just finished re recapping my console before he died. It was very sad. You know, yeah. it was, um, he was a great guy. It was yeah. always fun to have around. So many stories. Yeah, and uh, and and it's great. I, I like to use it on guitar a lot. It's a very strange thing. You know, again, once I said, I'll, I'll look and see what the harmonic content is. I noticed when you get to like minus 12 dB, you're all, you're mostly even harmonics. And then you kind of, at... 12 you hit both even and odd and then after that it becomes more odd so it, it's a very weird mm -hmm. you know i've never seen that in a in, in a uh, compressor before where it's you know you're either odd or even or harmonics or both i also read uh, jeff emmerich said they use this he personally used this 99 percent of the time and not fairchilds so there's got to be something about it. Again, though, getting back to what we were talking about earlier, it's just what was plugged in. Yeah, it's what was. It's what they had that worked, and they had and they had four thirty six Cs, which they deemed to be useless, and they decided to make something that worked. And right. you know, and how many great mech records have been made without them or Fairchild's a million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's just it's just it's you know fetishism. Still, I'd love a Fairchild. I wouldn't say no. <laughs> this is an RCA BA six A. Yep. Uh, which also uses the same type of very mu circuit that the Fairchild, people call it the f poor man's Fairchild. It, it doesn't have as cool a attack and release mm -hmm. signature as the Fairchild, but it makes things big. Mm -hmm. And when I tend to use it is when somebody sends me a vocal that sounds thin mm -hmm. and I need to mix and I need to pop out in a mix and, and okay, I wish you had recorded on a U47, but you didn't, it would have sounded better. I'll actually, I'll re-record it through this and it really gives it some girth and some presence and helps it sit better in the mix. Wonderful. Um, and, and when the room gets too cold, I turn it on. <laughs> um, and then, I'm guessing there's a lot of tubes in yeah. there. And then we have a, uh, one of the earlier, I think revision three Manly Very Muse, which I changed to the T-Bar mod with the high, pot, high pass side chain. I love this. this pretty much lives on my stereo bus now. Great. Um, I'll track with it a lot too on various things. But I, I just, it's just nice, you know, I like just some gentle, you know, dB and a half, two dB of compression. And it just puts a nice color, especially when you're mixing in the box. It just puts that little extra glue and little extra flavor. Wonderful. So it's a 33609B. Wonderful. Which I, I thought I was gonna love it on the stereo bus, I don't. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you on that one. I get, I, I've mentioned that in a couple of videos over the last couple of years of doing that, that I, I wasn't a big, and people are like, what, you're crazy. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm with you. I find it to kind of lack color and character, mm -hmm. which is the thing that is nice about it. But it's, I, I tend to use it on overheads because it's so quick and because I don't record symbols, I record the kit with my overheads. Sure. I, I completely relate to that. And this allows me to control, this will grab the snare and bring the snare to overhead ratio where mm. I want it. So, Wonderful. so um, if I, because it's just so, it's so fast. Uh, and, and yeah, so that way I don't have, you know, I feel like I have too much overhead and I mean, too much snare in my overhead. That's and, wonderful. And here's the 1178 we talked about. Wonderful. Um, which... uh, you were one of the first people I saw using a purple. Yeah. I remember coming over here and going, what is that? Like 17 years ago. Yeah, but their early ones, they had this really floppy, ballistically floppy VU meter that I hated. So I took an old Yuri meter and threw it in. So it didn't oh, yeah. drive me nuts. I just noticed that, yeah. Yeah, and um, I, you know, it sounds like a recapped uh, revision F or whatever, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the amazing sounding 1176s sound amazing because they're out of spec. <laughs> right. <laughs> because right. they're they're just ripe to a certain yeah, you know. They're they're ripe before they're rotten. And LA2A? Yes. Um vintage transformers in this one. Otherwise, it's a You new... have a favorite thing you use this on? I like it on acoustic guitars. I like it on bass. Uh I like it on I love electric guitars through LA-2As because of the fat, the, the slow opto attack mm -hmm. allows the transient to come through. Like I said, that's a problem sometimes on a vocal because mm -hmm. it's sibilance. 
Yeah. But it's it's when you're digging into the guitar, especially because you're already compressing because it's distorted, you know, mm -hmm. and it allows like that little thing to come in. And that's nice too sometimes on acoustic so that the strum comes through and, okay, and, and it's the leading edge, sense. but then evens everything out nicely. That's great. Uh, I'm not a big LA-2A vocal guy. I know a lot of people are. I'm, <clears throat> I'm just not. I've never had a good time with it, but then one of my favorite mixers is Mark Ender, and he likes them. Yeah. So he knows how to make it work where I don't. You, you know what? I, I see people come into my room and use all my gear in a way I never have or never would and get a great sound. Exactly. So, you know, that's the way that is. What is the phrase? A thousand ways to skin a cat? Well, there's, <laughs> there's no right way to record, but there is a wrong way. And you'll know it when you hear it. Um, you use 73 Bs? Yes. And I need to find some, they, these were intended for, I think, broadcast or something. They have a high pass built into them, mm. uh, which Oliver was going to remove from me before his death. And uh, I, when, one day I'm going to find, and they sound so cool, but one day I'm going to find somebody. Uh, I've traced through the schematic and cannot find... Uh, where that high pass is in the schematic wow. and it, it doesn't it's not quite lining up and, and and most people don't even want to touch these things But uh, they're what very about cool the sounding. Chandler guys, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they be um, like the Chandler guys? I don't know. I could ask Wade. Yeah, I would have thought just because yeah. of the Abbey Road Association I, I, For some reason I feel like he would know, but what do I know? I don't know and and many years ago I got these when you know, the only people making an LA2A type thing yep. were, were Demaria and Summit and uh, and I was like, oh, they have they have the right thing. You know, I bought these like 23 years ago, but the sound was a little lacking. And and uh, I I bought some vintage UTC transformers and threw them in. It's like, oh, and and when I compare them to an actual LA2A, you do a side by side, it's the same. Great. Uh, you know, the transformer is always so much of the sound. It's interesting when you were talking about the human connections of the vocal and the compressors. I was. It also reminded me of what Brian Colstrom used to say about his summits. Because it, that's and he and I always remember because he remember he had um, <coughs> he had all the summit mic pre's mm -hmm. he had, he had everything I mean he had like forty eight channels of mic pre's compressor and an EQ and I felt the same way that you know you could slam into them and even though the compression was working you never right. hear it go <coughs> it never choked it it just seemed to control it right yeah so yeah very helpful um, okay uh, so you're using a symphony yes I'm using a symphony and I satellite but I have about I have a, a pair of eight cores. I'm a big UAD guy, and and, right. and uh, I had to learn to mix in the box to mm -hmm. make it where I thought sounded as good as my. Uh, you know, it's, I had to, when I started trying to mix in the box like I would mix on a console. Right. It sounded boring, and I had to learn how to mix in the box, and and uh, UAD made that very possible for me because oh, I know pe I know people who do it with like the old waves renaissance plugins and do great mixes like I can't do that I need to go like sure. I want this sound I'll use the helio so I know I'll get that sound and um, I understand and because everyone wants 10 recalls these days and I have to do things I think I told you about a record where I had to mix six songs in 14 hours I would never be able to do that on the console right and then revisit them for you know for makes perfect sense yeah so uh, that's most the gig these days is in the box See, uh, Syndrome get, uh, Gates. Yeah, yeah, which, which never get used. I mean, these, and these were great, uh, these LA-22s went back when we you needed extra compressors instead, yep. instead of the <clears throat> 160Xs. Love the transient designer. And uh, I have now just become, a, I usually was just using it in the mix, and now I've become a fan of tracking with it, mm. especially because it does things like when I have someone, when I have the kick drum that has just a little bit too much overhang and it's taken the energy out of the bass because it lasts mm. just a hair too long, I can just pull back the decay on that without having to put a pillow in it that kind of kills the, mm. or the snare where you want the ring, but the ring, you know, you don't want to put too many gels on it. Yeah. So that it has the ring, but the ring's too long. Once again, transient designer. That's a great um, idea. So, so I actually, tracking wise, I will like it more for the sustain portion mm. than for the attack portion. But sure. it's mixing sometimes, though, I'll like it for the attack portion when I want some more crack. Yeah, they're amazing. Loving the Obsidian. Like this company. This is, uh, when I mix in the box, mm -hmm. I come out through the pull tech and, N and NTI. Mm -hmm. And then I, if I want SSL compression, I go into this, 
And then afterwards, I'll maybe I'll also go into this for just a little more flavor. Mm -hmm. But I like that this is actually a, has transformers and sounds a little meatier to me than the SSL, but it is an SSL compressor. Yeah, and the high pass is a big deal. Yeah, the high pass side chain is great. But, yeah. when, but when you want like that SSL type compression, uh, this is the, the DPR-901, BSS DPR-901, was the original multi-band compressor. Um, oh, Mark Endo. Tell me about this. This was a Bob Clear Mountain trick on vocals. It, it, it was a, it was a lifesaver on a number of things, and also when I'd get vocals where some I'd someone would send me something where it'd been over modulated or whatever, I, I could fix a lot of things. Mm. But it was uh, before we had in the box stuff. Um, that was that. This was a lifesaver on many things. A couple of lexicons, couple PCM of lexicons, yeah, which ne never get turned on anymore. H three thousand. This you know this occasionally gets turned on for something. Um, I love the instant flanger and instant phaser. This is cashmere, of course, you know, yeah. that, that's the symbol swirl through all of cashmere. Yeah. The instant flanger has a Doppler thing, which I use for the keyboard sound on David Bowie, Ashes to Ashes, that do, 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 is yeah. either a piano or electric piano through that doing the high speed Doppler. I didn't know that. And, and you're talking uh, one of my favorite ever songs. I right. name check in production all the time. So this and, is wonderful information. <laughs> I have a little secret sauce uh, ear candy thing that I do where I will take a clav and run it through a high speed phaser and then put a celeste through that with the Doppler. Mm -hmm. And that kind of comes in as the little ear candy part. In That's the, fantastic. And yeah. And then we have the stalwart. Uh, this was the clean delay that we had back in the day, particularly mm -hmm. when when we couldn't time shift stuff. If something was too early, we would run it through the SDE 3000 when we weren't just using it as like a slap or delay. Mm -hmm. And then we would, you know, figure out how, and, and we would nudge that with that mm -hmm. backwards. Or if it was too late, you want to make it early, you'd play the tape backwards and record it with the appropriate, you know, and punch in through the delay. and. That was a real trick for that. And when we had to tune on this thing, that was a real bitch. Well, I remember those days. And I was just, I just got this. I'm so happy. I've never had a 41. I'm so happy about this. Well, I was, we were using a 42 for slapback on this record I was just doing in Nashville. And I loved how crappy it sounded. It was awesome. I'm like, oh, 12 bit digital. It's amazing. Um, and the 41 is the same, except you it's not digitally controlled and you lose the settings once you mm. you restart it but it was only 300 bucks really? so <laughs> oh dear so i'm like love that i saw it on i saw it on ebay and i'm like done because i was just i was i was enjoying the 42 so much i'm like no, i don't want to spend a thousand bucks on a one trick pony yeah I understand. you know and uh, i saw that and um it's really it's just a really crappy sounding reverb that is what sure. you know because it comes back in sort of 12-bit distortion mm -hmm. that is awesome as a slap. Sure. And uh, yeah, and that's what's going on. And then there's a Rev 5? There's a Rev 5, which I've just, which I had back at Cole rehearsal and took that out. I don't think, I don't know when the last time I used that one was. And um, then what's Jonathan Little's thing down the bottom there? Oh, that is the IBP, the in-between phase. Oh, okay. Uh, which is fantastic for uh, when now we have it in the box, but it's great too when you have a, 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 a base DI, base amp, or something. Yeah, just something where it, the phase just isn't playing nice, and uh, it's it's actually an all pass filter uh, that allows you to adjust the you know partially adjust the phase, but you can go in between phase, and so you're not just either zero or ninety or one eighty. Mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of slide in between and 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 change the phase relationship of uh, a couple mics. Or a couple sources, uh, and and get a sound that you hate less, <laughs> which is half the battle. It's like I don't, you know. It's a. What do you think? I don't hate it. That's my response all the time. So <laughs> I can work with it. In the '90s, Malcolm Toft uh, had left Trident, and he went to make his new company, Malcolm Toft and Associates, uh, and he basically took the Trident Series 80C and wanted to make it more affordable so he did a transformerless input but took essentially the uh the the series 80 uh eq section and then he wound up going with the op amps that everyone was always upgrading their series 80s to and then he went with more auxiliaries 
And at the time, you know, which was unheard of to get a new console in a large format for 35 grand when I was building the room, it was great because it was either that you're going to get an, you know, an AMAC or a Scorpion TAC or something. I had one. Yeah. And, 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 but you couldn't get those in this larger factor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it had a great pre with a ton of headroom, and it had the Series 80 type sound, mm -hmm. which is so much of 80s and 90s rock and roll. Um, you know, the, the most well known, I would say, would be uh, uh, would be Appetite for Destruction was tracked on a Series 80. I come to find out later that OK Computer, you know, they used one of these on OK Computer and Kid A and uh, uh, Amnesiac, uh, but. I don't know at what portion, if it was just monitoring, but that, sure. that became the claim to fame. Was but uh, So when I started the thing, before we had Pro Tools, I had my 827 and I had a 3M16 and we would do our basics to the 16 track and then slave over to the 2 inch 24. And, uh, and we would use just the outboard pretty much, mostly to go to tape. And this was for monitoring and mixing. And that was how we were doing it back in the 90s. Uh, and I, once again, Steve Furlot, I had him put his discrete stereo bus section in. Great. So, you, you know, the one weakness of this console would be headroom. Um, but the stereo bus section, you could bury the VU meters and have no distortion. And, and it sounded so good. And there was a, one of the first records that was mixed on here. Half of it was mixed at, on the 8078 at Mad Hatter. And the other half was... Oh. And the other half was mixed on this. And the mastering guy wasn't like where the, you know, he thought they were all mixed on the same console, so. Great. Uh, that was... I love the look of this. Yeah, it's it's really, you know, um, simply because I'm going to, I like this, you know, it's, it, it's aggressive and I like discrete tracking consoles and the intention was to uh, have this mainly as the mixed console. So, you know, I'm, I'm building a new room and we're going to say goodbye to this console who served me terribly well and it, which has kind of just become a giant talkback machine at this point. Uh, because I want a console that I will want to track through mm -hmm. and, and make records as God intended, you know, like <laughs> on a console. Not, not with a bunch of, uh, you know, it was so nice. I was, I was in Nashville and we were working on an 80 channel, 8078. Which studio? Uh, at Oceanway, uh, room one. Wonderful. And not only was it a great sounding console, uh, 79 of the channels worked uh, perfectly, which is a miracle on an 8078. It is a miracle. And, <laughs> um, and with the exception of a couple things like, you know, I wanted to have the APIs on bass and, mm -hmm. and V72s on the overhead and then use the back rack. For every, everything was done on the console as records used to be done. You know, sure. you didn't, everyone didn't have all their little boutique stuff of, hey, what's the best mic pre for, uh, you know, uh, country gospel? Like, as you see on so many forums, like, it's like, you know, you, you have the one that's there and you make it work. Sure. And, uh, well, it's interesting, you've got like Spectrasonic stuff, which was in like Memphis and New York. I mean, talk Correct. about completely different genres. You've got Jack and Jay Messina and Shelley making records on Spectrasonics, like Patti Smith and, you know, and uh, New York Dolls. All those albums are being made on Spectrasonic at the same time as Memphis Stack stuff is being made. It's like, you know. And none of those records sound alike either. None of the records sound alike. So, um, so quick, a couple of quick questions before we uh, wrap up. 1031s? Ten, I am, yeah, I, uh, when I started out, you had options other than the NS10 or the Tannoys, mm -hmm. and these were new, and I immediately liked them, and I immediately hated NS10s. Um, By the way, anybody that's listening, that is not the cameraman, cameraman breathing deeply yes, before sir. we get all the trolling. Yes, it is sir, a, yes, the sir. puppy asleep. Yes, who was, who was squeaking earlier. <laughs> uh, the squeaking was not Warren's guitar playing. <laughs> um, so, Unless it sounded good, then yeah, it was. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so the Gentle X, yeah, and I, you know. I still use mine. I, st I have to mix on them. Uh, I, I will tell you, though, my ears get a little fatigued, and even moving them off the meter bridge really helped. My ears get a little fatigued tracking on them, uh, and I really enjoyed these Amphion. Uh, I haven't yet used them. You like them? Yes. Great. The 218s. They sound fantastic, and 
uh, my ears don't know them enough to mix on them. I have to mix on the Gentle X, but I, I can track on them fine and my ears last a lot longer because the high end's a little smoother, even with however much high end roll off is going on. on. Now the bigs, what are those? These are uh, JBL Olympus S8Rs that belonged to my father and were in our living room. Oh, wow. Uh, that he used to power with old Marantz tube amplifiers. Uh, and when I was building this room, I was like, hey, let's just throw those. And, and so they are um, tuned and crossed over on some white 4400 EQs. Uh, the bottom, the 15, and this is a passive 15, that's an active 15, I have to, uh, the bottoms are, um, powered by a, a, a Yamaha 2700, but the top and the bullet in the mid-range are powered by these manly 35 watt mono blocks that used to oh, be wow. Ivana's, in, just to kind of smooth out, we thought the idea was it'll just kind of smooth out the top end and make it a little less metallic and harsh. Uh, and I have, to, I have to get the sounds redone on this because I was mixing some EDM for the first time and I put a little too much bottom end and I wound up tearing the surrounds on oh, my wow. 15s. So I was like, why does it sound so bad all of a sudden? I'm like, oh, because the surrounds are ripped. So I have to pull those out this There's week. a little note for Smart. You've got your uh, cork tuner above so you can see it anywhere in the room. Nobody can yeah, basically. It. I used to have a Sony, uh, whatever the half inch thing was, you know, back sure. But so when you had to do stuff to tape, that's what you had, you had half inch machines and, and you run everything off the micro links and everything syncs together. And now, yeah. Oh. Don't forget the R2-D2. Don't forget R2-D2. Well, R2 we have, first of all, we have an echo plate tube tucked away somewhere uh, if you want a real plate. And then we have the 251, which was the successor to the 250. But uh, David Kolka managed to... Um, recreate the 250 proms uh, so you can actually access all the 250 sounds in this as well. Oh, so wow. You, so you have the best of both worlds and it's a good deal cheaper than a regular 250 and it's fantastic. You know, it just, it's the... I love seeing those. I yeah. go into the studio and I see that. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Yeah, and it's funny. I was... Um, when I mix, I'll get the mix where I want it, and then I get to a point where I pull up a song that I think sounds really good in a similar vein, because I'm doing two things. I want to see where my bass level is, I want to see where my snare level is, and I want to see where like, my vocal level is, and I want to see where my overall brightness is. That's four things, sorry. Uh, <laughs> our, right. our, 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 um, yes, so. Uh, we do music. I was, I was, I was, I was, well, I was going to go into Monty Python, our, yeah. our, our three secret weapons. Uh, yeah. And, I pulled up some something off Super Unknown. I'm like, God damn that that snare reverb is so good. And I happened to you know be friendly with Brendan. And I'm like, What's the reverb on? He's like, I always use a 250 on my drums. There you go. And I was like, There you go. Well, now now we're gonna get that snare reverb. So thank you, Brendan, for sharing the information. I hope I didn't give away one of your trade secrets. But, he never does interviews, so no, he doesn't. So yeah. he's probably Keeps never going to. He's probably never going to talk to me again now. <laughs> so there you have it, and uh, wonderful. Well, thanks for showing us around. Hey, man, it was it was. You're we, all we've been, friends. We've been threatening to do this for a while, and for I'm, a couple I'm of glad. Years. Yes, I'm, it was I'm, like AES, Nam, yes, Nam, AES. I'm, I'm 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 glad that we finally got to do it. Marvelous. Uh, very enjoyable time. All right. Well, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Maybe I'll ask him to answer something. Or I might, I might, or or troll me, and I'll come up and say something terrible to you about you know muscle shirts or for muscles or whatever. <laughs> Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thank you ever so much for watching.